Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, and thank you for your patience. Uh, we'd like to, to welcome you to um, Brock University <laughs> virtually today, um, and and thank you for joining us on this uh, wonderful Wednesday morning. Um, you are here at uh, a special lecture that, that we've organized thanks to an organization called the Ireland University, and we Fellowship lecture uh, entitled Design Thinking and Innovation Engine for the 21st Century, and our guest speaker from the University College Cork, Ireland, um, and a good friend and colleague of mine, Fiona Chambers. Uh, before we begin today, I uh, just want to start off by um, acknowledging the lands on which we would gather now. Typically for Brock, we'd be here in St. Catharines, Ontario. Um, and the, the university is on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, uh, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties is, and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. And although we have people coming from all over the world, both sides of the pond, we could say, uh, it is uh, important for us to, to just take a minute and consider those things. Um, before we jump into uh, Dr. Chambers' um, discussion today or, or presentation today, uh, I would like to welcome those who have made this event possible. And we're lucky enough to have the CEO uh, from uh, the Ireland Canada University Foundation, uh, Mr. James Kelly here. And so I'm going to pass it over to him uh, to, to share a, a greeting and a few words from, from them. So, James. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan. You can hear me okay? Yes, great, great. Uh, thank you very much. It is my great pleasure to be visiting you in Brock University virtually. Um, I haven't made it there physically yet, but hopefully at some at some point in the future. Um, on behalf of the Ireland Canada University Foundation, can I say that it is our great pleasure to be supporting this fellowship. Um, just a little bit of background on our foundation. Um, we have for over 20 years been supporting um, academic exchange and building connections between Canada and Ireland. And we have uh, over those years um, given uh, uh, awarded 500 scholarships enabling people to travel between Canada and Ireland and um, Nathan it's great to see you uh, as a former scholar uh, a Flaherty scholar um, engaging with us again on this program and that's that you know we're, we're really all about building connections and engagement so it is really uh, it's really great to see um, a program like the Beacon program enabling us to uh, further build on past uh, connections. Um, so our work is about connecting people, as I say, but it's not just about connections. Um, we look, uh, our foundation, um, increasingly at, at what our mission is. And, and our mission is how we can support um, Irish and Canadian people working together in ways that can contribute to the lives of the people in both of our countries and in the wider world now and into the future and for this reason um it is as i say a great pleasure to be supporting this particular um this fellowship so i'd like to congratulate dr fiona chambers of university college cork and um, i really look forward to this uh this lecture i'm really interested in design thinking and as we were discussing just before going live um you know now perhaps now more than ever you know the changes that we're going through design thinking is such a, a powerful tool in terms of seeking opportunities uh, at times of significant change um i'd like to thank you professor hall and your team and brock for coming to us with this um uh, this proposal uh, for the beacon program the beacon program itself i i'm happy to say i think is quite an in innovative approach to the challenges we faced in the in the last uh, last year, um, 
as I said, up until now, we've been supporting people traveling back and forth. But obviously with the lockdown, that's no longer, not currently possible. Um, but we have for some time also been, been looking for ways that we could continue to build links between both of our countries um, in ways that don't always depend on the use of fossil fuels. Um, of course, it's it's so important for people to meet face to face to you know to build friendship, but we're really excited by the Beacon Program in how it can help provide meaningful connections between people in both countries, um, ways that I hope you know will lead to further connection and meeting physically. But it's, for us, it's a it's a this program isn't just about a response to COVID, but it is looking to the future and how can we make the friendship between our countries uh, more sustainable. Um, so those of you watching this now, uh, this live feed, um, will see that it's, a, it's the public element of the Beacon program. And it's really important to us that the, these lectures are shared widely. And um, we've had uh, perhaps maybe 15 Beacon fellowships uh, between Irish and Canadian awardees um, over the past year. And these can all be viewed on our, uh, on our media channels. And I think my colleague Amanda might put a link into that if anyone's interested. We've had um, lectures by former President of Ireland um, and um, uh, uh, the Honourable Jean Charest, uh, former Premier of Quebec. There were two uh, inaugural lectures, but many lectures across very many different interesting areas. So uh, you might like to look at those. But the other element, and I won't keep it much longer, the other aspect to this programme, besides the public lecture, are the follow-on smaller events. And this is a part of all of our Beacon um, fellowships, is that we will uh, we support um, uh, Dr. Chambers uh, engaging with, um, with Nathan and his team there in smaller groups to enable those one-to-one -one connections that are that are so important, and there'll be a series of those following on from this lecture. Um, I'd like to just thank the governments of both of our countries who support uh, the, the Beacon Fellowship Programme. The Canadian government support this through the Global Affairs, through Global Affairs Canada, and the Irish government support this programme through the Emigrant Support Programme in the Foreign Affairs, Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, okay, I just really like to close now by wishing you um, the very best for this fellowship. Um, and I've no doubt that arising from this lecture and from the follow on uh, events, that there'll be plenty of opportunities for friendship and connections to develop and grow between our two countries in ways that will uh, benefit the people of our countries as well as uh, the wider global community. So with that, uh, back to you, Professor Hall, and thank you. Thank you very much for that, James. And again, we, we truly appreciate the Ireland Canada University Foundation for their support and allowing myself and, and Dr. Chambers to continue working together and, uh, and setting up this wonderful opportunity to share uh, all of the great things she has to offer with uh, the people at Brock. I have only been a member of the, the Brock family since last August, and uh, this is a, a great chance for me to, to show uh, some some of the wonderful individuals that I work with and, and bring them to the new campus that uh, I'm anxious to see more, considering I've only been on it twice since uh, since starting there, thanks to COVID. But uh, virtually, this works great, and uh, I do think everyone today will really enjoy hearing from, from Dr. Chambers. Uh, just a few housekeeping things, everyone. So this is a live stream. It's not Teams or Zoom where you can uh, chat and, and just, you know, see an ongoing discussion. If you do have questions for Dr. Chambers today, what I encourage you to do is to post them in the chat, and the way that it will work is I will see them, and I can approve them. Uh, I encourage you to ask the questions as we go while they're in your head um, because she's going to cover a lot knowing Fiona. And so um, ask them as we go. And then when we get to the question and answer period at the end, I will ask the questions for you. So, so post them in the chat and I will share them. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Fiona Chambers from University College Cork. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to do so. I have known Fiona since 2017, we met in Newfoundland, and it's been a wonderful working relationship ever since. Uh, Fiona is currently the head of the School of Education and a senior lecturer in phys ed and sport pedagogy 
at uh, University College Cork, which is a beautiful university if you ever get the chance to go visit in Ireland. Um, she is a Hassel Plattner Institute certified design thinking coach, and that is what she's going to be talking to you about today is design thinking. Um, but Fiona is an educational visionary, an academic leader who uses a human-centered problem-solving mindset, which is design thinking, to innovate. Um, she brings multiple and diverse stakeholders together to develop approaches that achieve various goals in teaching, research, and civic engagement. Um, she describes herself as a maven who's connecting people into powerful networks to enact educational change at third level schools and in the community. Um, she's honed these skills over, 30 year, of, over a 30 year career spanning a six year career as a senior bank official, 12 year career as a middle manager, a teacher of phys ed, science and well-being. And uh, she does believe that scholarship must have impact. Um, and this professional goal is delivered through a focus on enhancing the learner's experience in formal, non-formal, and informal settings. Her teaching and research focuses particularly in the areas of physical education and sport pedagogy, mentoring, and social innovation. And I could go on and on about her accolades, her many publications, um, but we only have so much time today, and I think it is more exciting for us to get to what we've all come for, and that is hearing Dr. Chambers share her wealth of knowledge in the area of design thinking and getting us thinking today. So without further ado, Dr. Chambers, it is my absolute pleasure and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that, thank you. So I'll start sh uh, sharing slides now, if that's okay with everybody. And it's two seconds. Can I just check with you, Nate, that you can see my first slide? It is up and looks wonderful. Excellent, wonderful. So um, just to start with, um, this keynote, as you've said, is the first in a series of design thinking events that are happening this month in Brock University. And I'm going to lead them as part of this Darcy McGee Beacon Fellowship. First of all, I want to express my sincere thanks to the Ireland Canada University Foundation for this great honor and in particular to CEO James Kelly and to Amanda Hopkins for all of their help thus far. I'm also extremely grateful to Dr. Nathan Hall for the nomination and to Brock University for hosting me. As you know, this fellowship is in honor of a very famous Irish man. Um, his full title is Thomas Darcy Etienne Grace Hughes McGee, and he died very tragically in 1868, exactly 100 years before I was born. We may have some things in common, however, as you will see. From Hedge School, or Irish Hedge, Hedge School, to Canadian Podium, Darcy McGee was a consummate storyteller. He knew the potency of words. He captures this in his poem entitled Digging. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests snug as a gun. Darcy McGee was an educator through his inspiring writing and orations a networker and a pioneer. He catalyzed change. He was both curious and courageous, and he was compassionate. Like me, Darcy McGee grew up on the political equator of the island of Ireland, living with political and religious diversity. I believe that such formative experiences shape a person. They lead a person to being very comfortable with ambiguity and with cognitive dissonance. James Joyce described this as the ability to hold two thinks at one time. And it is clear to me that Darcy McGee had this ability to hold two thinks at a time. So he was in sum, comfortable with ambiguity. He catalyzed change. He was curious and courageous. He was also compassionate. And to my mind, he was a design thinker. As this presentation unfolds, this will resonate much more clearly for you. And before I bring you on that journey, I would like to share a little of who I am and how I became a design thinker. I believe that your painting um, and your life is a painting on a canvas and every single experience matters in that lifespan. Every learning moment matters. And that painting evolves and iterates as you live your life. In terms of my own painting, I'm a wife, a mother, a singer, a runner and an artist. 
And as Nate pointed out earlier, I have over 30 years experience in both education and business sectors. And at one point I actually ran my own startup. In reflecting on my life and work, I'm the happiest when I'm engaged in startups, whether they're new programs, new services, new modules, new projects, and weirdly, even new choirs. My research, my teaching and community engagement intersect education, innovation and physical education and sport pedagogy. I'm actually the only design thinking coach and design sprint coach in my field. And as, as Dr. Hall pointed out, I'm one of 100 Hassel Plattner Institute licensed design thinking coaches worldwide. The more I work in the area of design thinking, the more I'm convinced that every university graduate needs to be a design thinker. Because in these very unique times, design thinking is an innovation engine for the 21st century. And now I'm going to share why I think that's the case. So in this very short presentation, I'm setting out this argument. We're going to begin by looking at our current and future global context. I'm then going to help you grapple with the notion of design thinking as a paradigm and how this superpower might help the world to reimagine life and work during and post pandemic. I'm going to share where design thinking is happening in society and also more locally how I have led a number of design thinking projects and programs in my own university. And in closing, I'm going to speak about how I've used design thinking in my social innovation projects in the community. So we're now going to move to that contextual piece. And to start with, we're really facing very, very wicked problems. And some of those wicked problems facing us are COVID-19, physical inactivity, and also climate change. And they're just some of them. When I talk about wicked problems, uh, Buchanan in 1992 talked about them as being complex, indeterminate and ill-defined problems in the sense that they're characterized by incomplete, changing, contradicting and interdependent information, which is very hard to gather. To survive in these times, there is a need for humankind to embrace a 21st century renaissance. Interestingly, the late Sir Ken Robinson describes his hope for our future in such a Renaissance period. And he says that our best hope for the future is to develop a new paradigm of human capacity, to meet a new era of human existence. And I believe firmly that design thinking is that paradigm. In a time of great disruption, the world needs to review, to reflect and reboot as we enter a new and emergent society 5.0. We have lived through a number of societies. Up to 1760, we lived in the hunter-gatherer society. In 1900, the agricultural society. In 1970, the industrial society. And in 2013, the information society. Now we're into an emergent society 5.0. And what has differentiated all of these societies has been their productive approach, their favorite material, their mode of transport, their form of settlement, and their city ideals. And Society 5.0 has a very particular set of traits. And these are super smart, which I will explain in a moment. The merging of cyberspace and physical space, new materials, and we call these material 5.0, autonomous driving and autonomous decentralized cities. And the word for me that jumps out is humanity. And I'll explain why that is the case now and why that's so important. These have significant implications for how we live, how we work, and importantly, how we educate our young people to thrive and to flourish. Let us now look a little bit more closely at Society 5.0. There are five key pillars in Society 5.0, which stand alone and also intertwine, giving greater complexity to the nuances of Society 5.0. And they are infrastructure, AI, healthcare, environmental, and logistics and effective communication. In Society 5.0, people and robots coexist in a people-centric and super smart society. What do I mean by that? I mean a society that is capable of providing the necessary goods and services to do those that need them at the required time 
and in just the right amount. A society that is able to respond precisely to a wide variety of social needs. A society in which all kinds of people can readily obtain high quality services, overcome differences of age, gender, region and language, and live vigorous and comfortable lives. In short, a more egalitarian society. In Society 5.0, human-centered values become so important. Moreover, robots are simply there to empower humans to become more creative and to develop more personalized experiences for citizens. Humans become the creators of something special and unique, and so human craftsmanship becomes a celebrated offering. The World Economic Forum calls out the values of Society 5.0, and they are problem solving and value creation, diversity, decentralization, resilience, and also sustainability and environmental harmony. In order to engage fully with Society 5.0, the World Economic Forum has described the 10 skills that citizens need to have. And it is clear to me that universities need to ensure that their graduates learn these 10 key skills in the course of their studies. And as this presentation unfolds, you will recognize that many of these skills are core to design thinking. I'm going to call your attention particularly to those who are marked in blue, because they relate directly to problem solving. With such an emphasis on being people-centered and super smart, in Society 5.0, engaged knowing becomes so important. What I mean by that is understanding the needs of fellow humans in a much more authentic way. Engaged knowing is also called empathy. And from my point of view, empathy is the fuel which drives design thinking in the service of humanity. So in sum, I believe that design thinking is a superpower which uses empathic innovation to help activate Society 5.0 and to attain this people-centered, super smart society. And now we're going to do a deep dive into design thinking. Design thinking tackles wicked or complex human-centered problems. So moving along the continuum of design challenges on this slide, we move from more simple challenges to more complex challenges. So from design as craft in the 1950s to design for experience, design for organizational transformation, and now to the design for system change. And the best way to describe this difference is as follows. So when I talk about something that is a very simple design challenge, it's something like baking a cake. So I follow a recipe and I bake the cake. When I'm talking about a more complicated design challenge, I'm talking about something very similar to building a rocket. That means that I am engaging multiple skills, diverse thought processes, disciplines, etc., to try and bring that to fruition. However, when I talk about something that is a complex design challenge, a, 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 a very straightforward example of this is raising a child. When I raise one child, I have raised one child. In order to reach an idea worth scaling for impact, there are three key elements to the innovation process, and they are desirability, feasibility, and viability. Desirable, design thinking attends to the desirability element. Desirability is essentially about humans, what they need and what they want. Feasibility is about technology. Viability is about the business element of that. And design innovation itself is at the sweet spot or intersection of these important three elements. What we're going to do now is to zoom in further on design thinking. And I'm making a very bold claim. This bold claim is that design thinking is actually powering and it's not just simply a process. So according to the recent work by Lawson and Tolstrop, it has actually got three elements um, which are required for anything to be recognized as a paradigm. Those three elements are worldview, reasoning, and truth criteria. So certainly from the point of view of design thinking, it has wicked problems as the worldview. 
the reasoning right throughout design thinking is abductive. And when I talk about abductive, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more to you. When we talk about this, I'm borrowing the words of Pierce in 1955, he described it as propositions or qualified guesses that are empirically tested subsequently. Martin in 2010 talked about abduction offering reasoning between something which is data-driven analytic, analytical thinking and the knowing without reason intuitive thinking through propositions. And basically what you're trying to do is to use an iterative process of suggesting and evaluating proposals so that you can actually figure out what is the problem at the heart of the matter and then what is the solution to that actual problem. The third element of a paradigm is this idea of truth criteria. And from the point of view of design thinking, it has something called contextual meaning. And basically what I mean by that is that the primary aim and the evaluation criteria of design thinking is to realize meaningful solutions. So in other words, we're trying to create artifacts that make sense in the context for which they were intended. And this is why empathy is like design thinking. So we will now have a look at the actual process involved in design thinking within that particular paradigm. And it begins with a mindset, which I believe is at the heart of the process. It then engages in a more, um, I suppose, um, very iterative process in a very, very empowering space. But I'm drawing your attention very closely to the fact that mindset is the starting point, the attitude, the disposition of, of the design team as a starting point, followed by what they're actually doing, and then followed by the um, empowering space in which that is nested. So these would be the three enabling factors for any design thinking team. So we'll start with mindset. I've said that's the most important one, and I'd like us to focus on this now. So in terms of disposition and attitude, that's the mindset. The design thinking mindset has 11 different attributes. These educators, practitioners, and researchers, we actually have these naturally. And when I, I share them with you, you'll see that. Um, and there are golden threads running through them, but let's have a little look at these 11. So I'm calling out empathy, and I mentioned it to you before. The idea of being able to be collaborative, but not just collaborative, that it's all about embracing diversity. And what I mean by that is diversity in every sense of the word diversity, from disciplinary di diversity to gender, to race, to um, attitude, to everything, you name it. Um, it the more the diverse, diverse the team is, the better this is going to be. Also, this idea of being really open and inquisitive and curious all through the process, being very mindful and thoughtful as we move through the process. Um, it's basically uh, thinking with your hands. A colleague, a lovely colleague of mine uh, spoke about this recently. So it's really about being very um, experiential in the attitude to this. Taking action very deliberately and carefully and overtly as we go through it being very consciously creative. You'll notice there's a lot of thought going in here. It's very deliberate, it's very careful. All of these types of words are coming in here. Being very, very um, accepting of not only certainty, but being very, very open to risk and taking a chance on something and iterating it further. Modeling behavior, and what I mean by that is saying yes and rather than no but. So being very open, optimistic to everybody's ideas and to see where they're going to take us in this design thinking journey. This is vital for me, number 10, wanting to make a difference, wanting to have an impact. That is actually, I believe, my purpose on this planet and design thinkers typically believe that that is their case too, that all of us need to have an impact, a positive and pro-social impact on our, on our planet. And finally, this notion of constantly critiquing questioning and, and maintaining that lovely curiosity as we go through it. There are golden threads running through these 11 and they're typically for me, curiosity, optimism, and this idea of not being afraid of risk or failure. Now I'm going to actually share with you the process, okay, that middle part of the diagram that I, I was speaking to you about earlier. So essentially I'm showing you the Hassel Plattner Institute model for design thinking, which is a six stage iterative process. And at all times as we move through the process, it's divergent and it's convergent. And it is certainly not like being on a train where we literally go from the understand bubble 
all the way through to the test bubble. It's a highly iterative process and teams typically will fluctuate and, and move backwards over and across these different stages to make sure that they get it right. Um, the steps actually fit, which is kind of interesting, within the Design Council in the UK. They're, they're dubbed down a problem space and solution space. And if you talk about problem space, you'll see where that, that shaded area is. And also there's your solution space. This process ensures that the design thinker spends at least 80% of their time in the problem space, trying to catch the problem and trying to understand it before moving near the solution space. This is something typically which is not very, I suppose, it's, it's not something that we naturally do as humans. We always feel, oh, I think I, I figured out what, what's going on here. I need to have this solution. And we do it fairly immediately. What design thinking does is it forces you to slow down and to really figure out what's happening. And I'm actually going to, to bring you back to what we spoke about earlier when I mentioned that design thinking was a paradigm. So when we talk about wicked problems, we're basically in the, in the problem space, in the understand, observe and point of view phase. And in this particular space, the design thinker is using reflection a lot to frame the object of reflection. In other words, what is the issue? And it's trying to force the, the design thinking team to go beyond the obvious and to really, really check out what's going on um, based on the problem they think they've identified. And Donald Schoen would have been a proponent, a very early proponent of design thinking. And he speaks about the idea of problem setting when you're in this problem space area. And problem setting is a process in which interactively we name the things that we're going to attend to and we frame the context in which we're going to attend to them. And that's typically when we land in the point of view space there, where we really articulate what, what this thing is about. And in order to formulate a design problem to be solved, um, basically what the designer is doing is framing a problematic design situation. And it's really important to set really clear boundaries and to select particular things that we're going to attend to and to impose some sort of coherence on the problem that we're going to try and, and uh, attack at that point. And this typically happens as we move from understand to observe and into that point of view space, as I said. When we move then into the solution space, we're typically engaging in abductive reasoning. And basically what we're trying to do is to come up with prototypes or models uh, that are, are ready for testing. So we move through ideation, we prototype, and then ultimately we test some of those ideas out and we see how we go. Um, and as we move through this entire six stage process, um, we do end up in a space where we can actually go back to those users or those citizens that we're trying to serve in this particular challenge and to check in, did we actually get this right? And now I'm going to use move to rather the external empowerment um, part. And as with any design thinking is not going to thrive unless it's situated in an empowering environment. And Coles in recent work in 19, uh, sorry, in 2019, he talks about um, this idea of an ecosystem of spaces, okay? And he's been quite interesting in the way he actually, um, I suppose, describes these. He describes an ecosystem um, of spaces as having some sort of hybridity. Uh, which allows us to dissolve existing dichotomies such as the physical and digital, formal, informal, learning and teaching, and also the individual and the collective. And basically it's about blending different space concepts. That's essentially what you're talking about. And the other piece to this, which is really coming to the fore as we live in this pandemic, is the fact that these spaces, whether they're online, whether they're offline, wherever they are, whether they're, they're as we call them out, hybrid spaces, they need to be highly flexible to actually meet the needs of the design team, or if you're actually teaching people how to do design thinking to meet the, the, the needs of the learners. And high flex points to the ability of the design team to really pivot to new ways of using space and to new ways of using the tools available within it as that process of design thinking uh, demands. And this is a little diagram from Cole's paper just showing and um, what this could look like really in a, in a I suppose, a face-to-face -face environment, all those different spaces. And so um, I just, I suppose I'm, I'm going to debunk something that's often said about design thinking. I hope you've gathered from what I've spoken about so far 
that contrary to, to thought, design thinking is not about moving fast and breaking things. And we often see that quote on the wall when we're talking about design thinking. It's actually about moving thoughtfully and improving things. And it was actually Henry Timms, who's the CEO of the Lincoln Center of Performing Arts in New York, who said this in a recent uh, podcast. And it's about using a mindset, a process within this empowering space to allow that to happen. Donald Schoen was one of the earliest proponents of design thinking, as I mentioned to you earlier, and the art of reflection. And I firmly believe that design thinking is a reflexive practice and is therefore transformational. So much so that for me, I believe that design thinking is a philosophical and practical approach to work and to life. For me, the way of being in the world. And now in this next section, I'm just going to move to some case studies and to show you where design thinking is happening in society. And I'm going to take an ecological view to this. So there are some exam exemplars of what I would call design nations. So these are governments who actively um, engage in design thinking to a greater or lesser extent, but these are some of them. And they use a hybrid architecture of top-down and bottom-up approaches to the developments of anything that's happening in their particular society. So Singapore is one that I would draw your attention to. It's probably the best example worldwide of where a government has entirely embraced um, design thinking. And I invite you to look at some really nice YouTube um, clips of their president speaking about how they use design thinking across every single aspect of government uh, to enact transformational change. I've also noticed that the Scottish government are embracing design thinking. And I've also noticed that Finland is doing so. And there may be other governments involved in this, as I say, to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, but these would be the ones that are on my radar, certainly. Next, I'm going to move to some of the companies that are using design thinking as a strategy for, and I would say actually everything. So for innovating their strategy, for developing new products, new services, and um, all aspects of, of, their, of their work. Um, one exemplar of, of uh, one of those companies um, is a company that um, it's called Logitech. And they would describe that every single thing that they do, and I do mean everything from ordering paper for the photocopier and how to do that in a more design thinkerly way, uh, they apply to even the smallest, the smallest tasks all the way up to the, the more macro and complex tasks. So every single aspect of, of their work uh, is, is basically uh, branded with uh, design thinking. And here are exemplars of lots of other companies that, that do that, and they're just examples. There are thousands of companies out there that use it. And you'll recognize some of these brand names. And um, so they would really just, it's part of the DNA of their companies. This is how they do business. I've called it Logitech simply because I, I know the company and I know some of the people working there and they do live it. I can actually see it in, in their work. Universities are also embracing design thinking to a, to a limited extent, I would suggest. It's happening in pockets in universities in various places, um, but not at a very sy systemic way, I, I would suggest at this point. And I really am encouraging universities to, to embrace this more fully. The government in Ireland has actually very recently, in 2020, put forward a national policy called the Together for Design policy. And what that's doing, and I think that's going to be a game changer really, it's pushing universities to educate graduates to be design thinkers. That's one element of this policy. So the government in our country, in Ireland, firmly believe that design thinking and innovation are ways into the future. That's Society 5.0 that I spoke about. What I'm going to do now is just share with you on this slide how I suppose the type of work that I'm doing in University College Cork. I've been using design thinking to develop policies with multiple stakeholders, including students. And I've been doing it as, as early as 2016. So I've been heavily involved in the design of the learning and teaching strategy at that point. Uh, the QPID, QPAD projects were kind of interesting and we, we kind of branded them in a particular way to catch the attention of students. And what we did in those particular projects were we set up design thinking pop-ups in our library. And the driver there really was trying to make students aware of policies on campus, of which there were 111, believe it or not but particularly to allow them to zone in on plagiarism as one of those policies. 
we branded them as Connected University, which is is one of the the backbone, so a backbone of our university and 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 how we do what we do, um, in this very connected way. So Connected University Policy Innovation Design, and you can gather from the little heart there that we launched that on Valentine's Day, um, in 2019, and then QPAD was actually one that we we launched on as we call it Paddy's Day or St. Patrick's Day. And again, that was just a, another um, iteration really of the Cupid project. That was really, really interesting and fun. And design thinking is a lot of fun, serious fun. The next one was the sports strategy. And then finally, we moved on to the, the mental health one. And really what I would say to you is the, the way in which we have been doing design thinking on campus has been to bring all of those stakeholders around the table um, and always to have student voice there. And basically to, um, to, to be as open as possible to what the students in particular are, are saying about their experience on campus and now on this virtual campus. And they've been really, really important and, and helping, I suppose, the university realize whom they're serving, which is our student body. As a researcher then, I've been thinking to innovate in pedagogy and assessment. And to this end, I've actually published a number of books. And um, what I've done is not to mind the topic of the book, which you can see digital well-being and mentoring and also threshold concepts in physical education. In editing these books, I strive to build design thinking capability among fellow researchers. So there's almost a meta learning opportunity in every single one of these books. And um, I'm trying to teach those people involved in writing the books with me how might they apply design thinking to solving complex research problems to create new insights, methodologies, or pedagogies to change practices? So really it's trying to build that design thinking capability uh, amongst the research population. And that has been great fun. In relation to my learning and team, uh, we're actually running um, since last year a bespoke program for non-design students. So in 2020, myself and my colleagues were awarded 1.5 million by the Higher Education Authority through their Human Capital Initiative to set up the very first postgraduate diploma in innovation through design thinking um, at University College Cork. What's really exciting about this is it's the first collaboration between the school that, that, uh, that I lead, the School of Education, and the Cork University Bus Business School on our campus. And it has been a joy. And tomorrow I have the superb fortune of hearing 45 of our students talk about their social innovation projects. And they, they are humbling to listen to the work they've done across this program. What is novel about the program, and this is what we believe, probably the reason why, why this was funded by the government, is that the curriculum pedagogy and assessment of the program is underpinned by a decubed prism of innovation praxis. And what do I mean by that? I mean it's a, a confluence of three different fluencies, not literacies, and that's I'm saying that on purpose. So a design fluency, a data fluency, and a digital fluency. And I believe it's the intersection of these three fluencies that provide rigor to design thinking, and they also um, underpin our action design approach. And we also, when we're moving through the program using this particular prism, we always like to share the pedagogy of design thinking so that our students can go forth and cascade that knowledge and, and share that with, with those they, they live and work with. We've adopted this approach as it feeds into our desire to educate students to live, work and shape society 5.0. After all, and this is a firm belief of mine, if we educate today's students as if they were living yesterday, we'd steal their tomorrow. In the final section, I'm going to share some of the social innovation work on which I'm leading. And essentially, in my community work, I'm using design thinking to drive innovation, social innovation, and I'm doing it not just locally, but globally. I founded a number of endeavors which are each tackling complex human-centered problems. So the very first one here is the Made to Move program, and that's a peer mentoring program which increases physical activity. And you remember on one of my very first slides, I said that physical inactivity was a wicked problem. This particular initiative is actually running in four countries now. And there's actually, um, what's really interesting is it actually started and really got on its feet, literally, 
within a module that I was teaching on in the in in University College Cork. So it was a creativity and innovation module, which is always about uh, developing social innovations that matter. So that kind of was born really within that module. The sister project for that is Community Made to Move, which means we're moving outside the walls of the university. Same premise, but outside the walls of the university. The next one is Wicked, and that was an international consortium that used design thinking to create educational solutions to tackle wicked problems. And in this particular endeavor, we actually worked on a project with the homeless. And we developed a works program for those people who are homeless to allow them to um, go get back to work um, to be able to earn some money, to get a reference, to get a bank account, such that they were in a position to actually uh, rent a home or actually purchase a home down the line. And that has been a, fant a, a fascinating project, that particular one. The next one was the Global Design uh, Challenge, which I founded on my kitchen table um, in April 2020. And that was in response, basically, to the wringing of hands around uh, sport and physical activity were on their knees because of the pandemic and I thought to myself if I could actually develop some mechanism of um, helping sport and physical activity to get on their feet again and um, we would be on to something. So what I created was basically um, a design thinking um, innovation engine which crowdsourced ideas for, for incubation and it, last year it had up to 200 teams from across 40 countries and 12 time zones competing. We put ourselves about 10,000 hours into this particular project to get it to get it going. The World Health Organization, UNESCO and the Commonwealth Secretariat observed us and we had 22 partners including TFISA, uh, Sport for Life Canada and ISCA and UEFA involved in that. We're moving to our next version of that now, which you can see it, we've slightly rebranded it. And that's going to launch this month. And I'll speak a little bit more about the last one now. So the Global Design Challenge for Sport and Physical Activity this year is this design thinking innovation engine that I talk about. And it's made up of seven key stages. And the GDC, as I call it for short, it does two things. It's building design thinking capability through education programs and hands on practice. And it turns fantastic ideas into feasible and viable projects for impact through mentoring and other supports. This year, we've had the very good fortune of being sponsored by Sport Ireland. We're aiming for 1000 teams from across the world, and they're going to basically compete under eight thematic areas to try and get sport and physical activity back in action. Projects have to meet the sustainable development goals as called out in the Kazan Action Plan. And the winners are going to get development grants up to 10,000 euro for incubating and accelerating their projects. And importantly, every team retains their own IP. So I have an ask of you, everybody listening here. I'm making a call to action. If you have an interest in tackling a wicked problem, i.e. getting sport and physical activity back in its feet, if you want to have a bit of fun with a diverse team that you gather together to tackle the challenge. If you want to learn how to do design thinking and to pitch your idea. And if you want to have a chance to win a development grant, then I'm asking you to register for the Global Design Challenge on the 7th of June. Once you've registered, you can avail of our education program and learn. I'm going to ask you then to compete during the 18th to 24th of June. That window of time and then finally to submit your idea to the judging process. So to close, um, my personal mission as an educator and design thinking evangelist is twofold in Society 5.0. It's firstly, as you probably gathered, to build design thinking capability firstly amongst students and others, obviously, and also to put forward the global design challenge as a problem agnostic design thinking innovation engine. I want to thank you sincerely for listening today. Once again, I am so grateful to the Ireland Canada University Foundation for this prestigious award, and particularly to Brock University for hosting me and to Dr. Nathan Hall for this invitation. Um, Goramila Mahagwiv. I um, would like to invite you to contact me in the following ways and to keep track of the Global Design Challenge in that, just to make sure that perhaps you might answer my call. 
Here are some more resources if you're really interested in design thinking and if I piqued your interest. So IDEO, Stanford University D School and the Hassel Plattner Institute and some readings that I have referred to here um, as we've moved through. And I now look forward to taking any questions from the audience. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. I feel like there should be a big round of applause, but it's uh, it's so tough to do it virtually. But uh, really, really interesting, stimulating conversation. Um, is there a website that is up yet for that competition for 2021? And the website, I've just come off a meeting before this. We're finalizing it and it's going through its its last test run. And what I will be doing for everybody who's listening, I will post that on my own Twitter feed, on LinkedIn. And we also have our own dedicated Twitter account at Global uh, Design CH1. Um, so please just follow me at Dr. Fee Chambers and you'll see that. That website is going live next week and you'll be able to register as, wait for it, you can register as a team. You can register as a mentor if you have four hours to give us over the summer. Um, and you can also uh, register as a partner if you feel your organization could help us with the incubation um, or acceleration of any of these ideas. And as I say, these teams will come with funding. So it's not as if you have to do it off, off the edge of your desk this year, thanks to Sports Ireland. Well, it's a fantastic initiative, and I, I do hope that uh, some Brock University teams emerge out of this. I think uh, it would be wonderful to, to see that. Um, we are going to open the floor to questions now, and as I mentioned, the easiest way to do this is for you to type your questions into the chat. Uh, we do have one already that uh, that I have shared, but I encourage others to, to jump in, send your questions for, for Dr. Chambers, and I will ask them, and we'll, we'll hear your response. So, uh, I'm not sure if you can see the first question that, that was posted in the chat. I believe that you might be able to, but it was from um, Dr. Tim Fletcher here at Brock University. And he asked, do you see design thinking as something that helps describe our existing approaches to innovating? Or is it a completely new approach that requires a conscious engagement with its principles from the outset? Or is it both? I think I, I, my sense of design thinking is it's a form of innovation, right? It isn't innovation per se. It's almost a, 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 a child of um, the, the concept of innovation. And yeah, it is absolutely, it's, it's everything that I've described in, in, in the fact that it is embedded within this very educational philosophy of, of reflection and reflective practice, experiential learning, all those things that we hold dear as educators. And so it's quite, um, Tim, I would say it's quite a natural thing for us as researchers and educators to engage in. It's, it's quite familiar in its process. And um, we're very attuned to the fact that we have to think about, uh, be quite deliberate and thoughtful about how we, we engage in any problems that we're trying to solve. And um, so it means that um, I would say that we have a natural, a natural affinity to, to, to doing this as educators. Um, and that universities, just to maybe, I suppose, to, to reinforce this, I think universities are very natural places for, for this to happen. And I'm really encouraging universities to try and embrace it and to embed this way of innovating. So design thinking being a way of innovating in everything we do. So I know this is a very big ask, but if we could imagine that all of our lecturing staff, all of our faculty, had this pedagogy of design thinking, this particular way of approaching our teaching and learning um, experiences, it would make for a very interesting type of graduate. So the graduates would obviously be learning disciplinary knowledge and, and all that goes with that, but they would have this other um, disposition as they're leaving the university uh, to tackle any problems that would face them in their industry or, or more broadly in society. So I suppose in answer to your question, Design thinking is almost a subset of innovation. It is highly powerful, as I've iterated all the way through, and I've, I've said this over and over again in the presentation. Universities are naturally disposed to this, this form of, of innovation. Um, and I'm calling for, because we're so naturally disposed, why can't we pull it into to, um, how we teach um, our students? And as, as the Irish government are trying to push, and um, we're trying to push this idea that every graduate is a design thinker. Actually, that's what we're trying to push at the moment in Ireland, certainly. 
Excellent. Thank you for uh, for that uh, insightful response. We we have another question. This is from a, a graduate student uh, new to uh, the PhD program, and actually not from Brock, but uh, a good colleague of mine through uh, Physical and Health Education Canada who really wanted to attend today. And Steve McGinley asks, um, making connections to current prototype projects currently rolling out, what are the initial steps to begin exploring design thinking? Is this something that is currently what stakeholders are doing? Or is uh, this a more deliberate approach? It, it's a mo Hi, Steve, by the way, it's great to hear from you. Um, so basically, what I would say to you is, uh, it's what I said earlier, often what people are doing, um, they're very, very quickly moving to trialing things out. And what, what I'm, I'm, I'm asking for really is that we slow it down. So an example of, of that was in the homelessness project that we worked on. Our hunch initially was they need a house. Obviously, homeless, they need a house. When we interrogated that particular issue, it was nothing to do with the house. It was to do with the nine hours in which homeless people are wandering around in between meals. So they would get a breakfast and they would get an evening meal and they had to try and find ways of occupying themselves during the nine hours. And we suddenly, when we hit on that eureka moment, it meant we were not looking for how can we get them a house? We were looking for how can we occupy them during the nine hours such that it empowers them to have the ability to have to, to rent a house or whatever and to stay in that house. So it, it changes and shifts if you if you take the time to spend um, as long as possible in that problem space and not to go to, um, I would say, prototyping too quickly. Um, and, and also not to be afraid if you're prototyping and when you go back to, to the person at the, at the end user, as we call them, and they're not liking the look of it, not to be afraid to go back and to check out, are you on the right track at all? Um, and and to, to scrap it and, and, and restart if necessary or iterate where, where you've got to. Thank you. Um, we're still open for more questions if there, there are any out there. Um, I did have a question myself. When you were talking about going through the process, Fiona, you talked about how we should be 80% in that problem phase, right? And 20% and in the solving. As a team, how do you know when you get to that point where you should be basically moving to that ID8 uh, and, and prototype point? Because could you not just cycle through this and get stuck in that problem phase forever? Um, you, you, there, is, there has to come a point where you decide and it's all full of, I, I was saying about convergent and divergent moments. So you typically, as you saw in the, in the slide, you're starting at something which is quite a convergent moment with, okay, we think broadly the issue here. And if I use um, an exemplar from, um, say for example, uh, when we talk about the Made to Move program, when we talk about physical inactivity. So you're starting out at the at the one end of your problem space and you're saying, okay, uh, we have a problem with physical inactivity and sedentary behavior, but that's too big. It's like too, too giant a problem. You could drive a truck through that problem. So what you've got to do is you have to try and find um, end users, people that you're trying to serve, um, that actually can articulate their experience of that particular issue. And what you tend to do is you cast the net pretty wide and you may be talking to, to girls, to underserved youth, whatever the different populations are. And you may suddenly decide, actually, of all of those, the most interesting group are girls for the moment. We're not going to go after all of them. We're going to settle on girls. So we're starting to narrow things down now at this point. From listening to the girls, they say that they have nobody to actually do this activity with. So you're thinking, okay, is there something there that might give us a glimmer as to what we could ideate on? So by the time you come to the, the point of view statement, you, you have set, as I said in the presentation, very, very clear parameters about how and um, what that, that problem statement is. So it's now about girls. It's about this fact of social connection. And you're starting to narrow, narrow, narrow it down. Then you're in a position to move off. And you will know that as soon as you get to that position, you say, I think the parameters are tight enough that we have something we can ideate from. And it is something that it comes to you with more and more practice. Um, and the more the design team work, team work together, the more confident they are about moving forward. The beautiful part of it, though, is the gate doesn't close as you move from problem space into solution space. You can go back again. 
if you said we move too quick or we move too slow or whatever it is we're 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 always able to to move and iterate backwards if we need to, to try and tighten things further if we're not that confident or it's not not giving enough ideas to us the other piece i would say to you as well it is such fun and it's not it is the topics are obviously very serious and one thing i have noticed is as soon as and often i know this as a researcher and as a, a scholar we tend to focus a lot on ourselves and how we perceive problems um, and what design thinking forces you to do is to shine the spotlight on the end user so it's all about the empathy towards the end user or the persona that you create that represents that end user and it's all about them it's not about you anymore and once that happens that shift or that empathy kicks in and it becomes um, a little bit more objective the other bit i would say to you is that every single thing is driven by data none of this is like i have a hunch that we should do this or i have a hunch we should do that every point so when you're gathering in the understand and observe phase you're using all of your fantastic research techniques to gather that data and making sure that you have it right and that you have gathered enough to to to, to formulate that uh, problem statement and um, so it's quite data driven and um, and that gives you a lot of confidence around uh, the process then i would suggest Excellent. Thank you. We, we have a question now from uh, another one of the professors in the Department of Kinesiology here, Dr. Phil Wilson, and he says the pandemic has encouraged innovation and change. Much of that innovation and change has emphasized, for better or for worse, speed as a key element. Can design thinking address global issues if speed is part of the equation? And, and I'm, I'm just, just checking in there. Um, I wonder, does he mean that it's like being so agile and moving very, very quickly to find solutions? I presume that's that's really what, what your colleague is referring to. What I, what I suppose what I mentioned in the in the in the slide deck was this idea of moving, moving thoughtfully to improve things. And um, of course, you can be agile in iterating, but you must be very confident around the process. Um, and what I would say to you is design thinking is quite a thoughtful process. The speedy part typically happens when we're confident around the problem and we can start ideating, prototyping quickly, rapid prototyping and getting it to the end user to check in with them. So I would say speed is an element, but it needs to be really in that uh, solution space. Problem space is thoughtful consideration making sure you're on the right track, making sure that you're you're actually solving the right problem, which is actually really, really important. And um, I would say then um, after that, once you've come through the design process and you remember one of the diagrams I talked about, desirability and feasibility and viability, once you have your design um, thinking solution on the table and ready for testing, you can then move to the speedy part, which is the more agile part of that's that that uh, IDO diagram that I shared with you earlier. And that's more moving to the feasibility bit where, where you're getting a little bit more agile and then you move into more business kind of brain where you're doing some of the lean techniques then. And um, I would suggest the desirability section or the design thinking part of that diagram is all about um, moving thoughtfully, improving things, and then you can get to the speed a little bit later. Actually, that's really how it works in reality. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we do have time for, I guess, one, maybe two more questions. I've got one uh, posted here. Uh, it is from outside our phys ed and kinesiology people at, at the university at Brock. Um, I think Kate Cassidy is from uh, our communications um, program and she is asking she says design thinking is about a system of innovation but also about soft skills slash attributes or mindset as you suggest how do you think about the development of these soft skills within pse that focuses on disciplinary content okay um so what i suppose it's it's back to this kind of um it's accepting diversity. And yes, of course, when we're, when we're talking about graduates, they have to have disciplinary knowledge and they need to be quite confident around that as they're bringing it to the table. But I suppose what, what design thinking um, does is it, it provides this empowering space where people can share their knowledge, et cetera. And through sharing their knowledge and their thoughts and their ideas in this design thinking process, those soft skills are, are fine-tuned. So 
you start to understand um, how to work with people. Um, this idea, when I said to you earlier, that you build upon other people's ideas, you don't block them. Um, all those really necessary soft skills for us to actually get on with each other and to, and to do great things together. And that's hard. And I know that from working with design teams and coaching design teams, they're tricky because you can have the the alpha uh, characters in the team and you, you, you have to try and work through maybe somebody who's a little bit more timid but has an awful lot to offer. So um, what I would say is that the strength of uh, facilitators in those environments where you can acknowledge the disciplinary knowledge that's coming to the table from each of the parties and typically they're coming from lots of angles and we understand that. But it's it's this inherent respect for each other that every single person in that team has something to offer, and that every idea is worthwhile for for the for the moment as you're moving through the process, and um, it takes a while to get into that um, into that kind of um, unsiloed kind of mindset, uh, but certainly the more you do this, the more the more it works. Um, I've been working with my, my students, like eighteen year olds, doing this. And it's fantastic to open their blinkers to this way of doing doing things. It's it's unbelievable. They're designing curriculum for the, for for their school uh, scenarios. They're designing social innovations for the community. And um, they're unbelievable in terms of what they're doing. But I've got to them kind of early, and I've been really pushing for the education education system to take this on much much earlier. I actually believe in primary school. This is the type of way of thinking that we need to, this design thinking uh, paradigm needs to be right through primary, uh, through middle school, high school, and all the way into the university. It just needs to be everywhere. Um, and it's not to say that um, it is the only thing in town, but it teaches you so much. If you were to look at the World Economic Forum list of skills, you can take every one of them and they will match your design thinking uh, paradigm. Every single one of them can be reached through that. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we're going to finish with our last question. This comes from uh, one of the graduate students, and I think it's a very appropriate question to end on here. Um, and Spencer asks, what do you see as the most effective way to reconcile the tensions and contrasts between an innovative model like design thinking and the ingrained institutional traditions, such as that within universities or education as a whole? I know, sure. It's it's what I referred to Spencer a minute ago. It's like um, it, what I'm seeing more and more of is like the universities are there to actually serve society. That's our function. And um, I, I, you cannot like you to be very careful. Disciplinary knowledge is vital. You you need, in some respects, you need some sort of um, silos going on in the university. But what's really really cool um, with this particular design thinking um, paradigm is the porosity that it actually brings, and it's it's all about really changing cultures. Spencer, it's it's like we have lived with this model of universities for, for a very long time. However, we're seeing a lot more cross collaboration and a lot more realization that the biggest problems and challenges in the world today cannot be solved by one silo or one discipline area. It's just not possible that we actually do need to come together. And the more that we, as I said to you earlier, we spotlight the wicked problem and we say collectively as a university, what disciplines can actually come around the table to try and solve that problem? For example, the pandemic, you can actually see that in action now. I think it's lifting the spotlight and shining it on those wicked problems rather than our differences. And often when you do that, you really get places. I would like all of you to watch a fabulous YouTube clip and it's called How Wolves Change Rivers. And it'll give you a little bit of an inspiration about how a change culture might come about and the most amazing impact that one, one change to that culture could actually bring about. So Wolves Change Rivers, and I'd like you to have a little look at it and it's kind of quite inspiring. And it's, it's exactly what I'm talking about there. Excellent. Well, uh, on behalf of everyone who's uh, hung around right till the end here and uh, and listened today, I would just like to give you our most uh, heartfelt thanks for sharing with us today your thoughts on this. Uh, there are some upcoming workshops that are going to be occurring at Brock over the next month with uh, small groups where we'll actually get to work um, in, in a, a small group situation doing some design thinking with Dr. Chambers with uh, graduate students and, and faculty members. 
if there's anyone out there who's still listening and uh, hasn't signed up or is interested in one of those, you can contact me. I've also shared uh, Dr. Chambers' Twitter and email in the uh, in the chat here today. Um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out and, and contact either one of us a, about this. But we appreciate you joining us today and, and listening in. We hope that uh, you took a, a few wonderful things away from this and uh, been enlightened or invigorated to, to look at problems and research differently. I know that I have. And uh, I look forward to, to working with you more down the road on this. But, but thank you so, so much for doing this. And once again, thank you to Brock University and University College Cork for helping set this up. And, uh, and James Kelly, as we see there, and the Ireland Canada University Foundation for making this all happen. It, uh, it wouldn't have happened without their, their support. And uh, we are extremely grateful for, for this opportunity. And I, I do hope that things continue to flourish and grow between our countries. And in this case, between the UCC and, and Brock uh, moving forward, I, I see so much potential here. And I do encourage uh, my Brock colleagues out there to think about this design thinking challenge and, uh, and let's get some teams in there and see if we can't uh, can't win something there this year. I think that would be exceptional. Thanks a million, Nate. Thank you.